All right, hello and welcome. Good afternoon from Southeast Michigan. I am Muzam El Hussein, an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of Communication and Media. I am also the associate director for the Center for Middle East and North African Studies, or SEMENAS for short, at the International Institute of the University of Michigan. Welcome to the fall colloquium uh, of the Center for Middle East and North African Studies, which takes place every fall uh, of the academic year, where we feature invited guest experts from around the world with expertise on interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches to studying the culture, the histories, and the experiences of regions and peoples in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, today is our first of seven scheduled Wednesdays. Um, I'd like to get us started by doing three uh, quick things. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the center, uh, a little bit about the colloquium, and then to introduce and welcome our guest today. Uh, number one, Semenas, the center which is hosting this colloquium, uh, began, uh, or the study of Middle Eastern and North African region at the university began in 1889. Uh, and the programmatic study of Middle Eastern and North Africa uh, uh, was done at the inception in 1961. So the University of Michigan has uh, been involved in the uh, study of Middle East and North African studies uh, for quite some time, uh, over a century in fact. Today, as a designated comprehensive national resource center of the U.S. Department of Education, Semenas is dedicated to promoting a broader and deeper understanding of the region uh, through research, education, and public outreach programming. Uh, as part of that, uh, the Fall Speakers Colloquium uh, 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 covers uh, uh, this semester, uh, the theme covers public health and pandemics across the Middle East and North Africa, a multidisciplinary exhibition. Uh, starting today with a historical focus, we will move on through the semester with a look at institutional, gendered, lexical, psychological, physiological, and behavioral ways of understanding how public health and pandemics have been experienced, managed, and understood in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, we meet every Wednesday between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. Our sessions typically run in three parts. First, our guest uh, speakers uh, uh, deliver prepared remarks for 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, then we break for a, a period of question and answer from our interested public who will also be attending. And finally, we will have uh, a smaller uh, discussion, int more intimate discussion section with our enrolled students at the center uh, to meet and um, uh, have a further discussion and dialogue with our guest experts from around the world. With that, I'd like to welcome you all, uh, and especially our honored guest today, Dr. Michael Christopher Lowe of the Iowa State University. Dr. Lowe is an assistant professor of history at Iowa State University, and he received his PhD from the Columbia University in New York in 2015. He is also author of Imperial Mecca, Ottoman Arabia and the Indian Ocean Hajj, published by Columbia University Press in 2020. Today's talk by Professor Lowe will build from this research and will cover the period of 1831 to 1914, where cholera spread from India to Mecca and the Hejaz on at least 40 separate occasions. In investigating this period, Professor Lowe traces the development and deployment of Ottoman and international quarantine and public health controls across the Hejaz, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf. His thesis is that this period of history and public health informed statecraft in the Middle East has informed the creation of the modern system of mass pilgrimage that we see annually unfold most publicly in the form of the Hajj in Saudi Arabia. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Christopher Lowe. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Get started. All right. Just uh, double check everyone can see the screen. All right, perfect. Uh, so again, uh, a big thanks to Professor Hussein and Kristen Waterbury for their uh, generous invitation to speak today. 
uh, and for their efforts uh, in organizing. Um, so I'll just say maybe at the sort of outset here, I won't say too much in my prepared remarks uh, about uh, potential comparisons and connections uh, between my research on cholera and our present uh, pandemic moment, but I do hope that that will come out uh, in the discussion a bit later. Um, you know, when I started this project, you know, some 15 years ago, uh, I couldn't have imagined that this book would be published in the midst of uh, sort of the, the biggest pandemic uh, of the last century. So uh, certainly there are some uncanny connections there that I hope that we can, can uh, tease out. So let me begin uh, sort of showing an overview of the sort of the area uh, that my research covers, a sort of uh, uh, Ottoman Empire, Arabian Peninsula, uh, and the Indian Ocean. So as Eric Tagliacozzo has argued, the industrialization of steam shipping, increased transoceanic travel, and global commerce all went hand in hand. And yet steam-powered imperialism was also a double-edged sword. It had the unintended consequence of forging ever faster and more interconnected pathways for the spread of deadly pathogens. If steam was the broader genre of mobility that enabled cholera to leap beyond its previous endemic range in India's Ganges Delta, it was the birth of a steam-powered pilgrimage travel industry that made the Hajj the ideal vehicle for cholera's global circulation in the 19th century. Caught in the middle of this global epidemic drama, the Ottoman Empire's position in the question of quarantine and international sanitary regulation has generally been eclipsed and even overshadowed by concerns around Europe's history with uh, epidemic disease. In this historiography, the Ottoman Empire appears as a kind of reluctant century posted at the gates of the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, a kind of semi-civilized buffer the last line of defense standing between Europe and the teeming hordes of cholera carrying pilgrims in the Indian Ocean Basin. The internationalized capitulatory nature of the Ottoman Board of Health is generally seen as proof that the application of quarantine regulations against the Hajj was almost wholly a product of European coercion. In other words, the erection of the sanitary state is viewed as an exclusively European project. By contrast, this talk poses a quite different set of questions. What was the Ottoman response to the global crisis of cholera? Why did the Ottoman state take such a central role in the erection of international quarantine systems during the 19th century? Was this a case of centralization through sanitation? And perhaps most critically, what were the technical limitations of Ottoman sanitary discipline on its Red Sea and Arabian frontiers? And how did inter-imperial rivalry and local resistance reshape and redirect these efforts? So I'd like to start with a kind of single case, uh, which I think is nice vignette that really sort of shows uh, the sort of desperation uh, of this moment. On the 19th of September, 1891, the postal steamer Nimeti Huda arrived in Istanbul. The steamship had completed its return journey from the Hijaz after the conclusion of the pilgrimage. One of the passengers on board was a man named Samsun Haji Mustafa Effendi. The following day, it was reported that Haji Mustafa had been laid up in bed with a suspected case of cholera. Haji Mustafa, of course, lived in the Galata Beolu area of Istanbul. And for those of you who might not be uh, uh, sort of intimately familiar with the, the mean streets of Istanbul, right? Uh, so this, if you look at the sort of bottom of this peninsula is the Galata Beolu or Para uh, area. And in the talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit uh, if you look to the left-hand uh, side of the screen, you'll see a sort of green patch, Haskoy and Kasim Pasha neighborhoods as well will figure into to some of my remarks. So this area, Galata, Para, Beolu, uh, placed Haji Mustafa in the middle of Istanbul's second most populous district, home to some, at the time, 220,000 souls, or roughly a quarter of the city's urban population. Here we have a sort of picture that sort of gives you a sense of some of the, the landscape here. In the top left, we have the, uh, the naval yards at Tersane uh, on the Golden Horn. In the bottom left, we see the famous Galata Tower. And then on the right side, another view of, of, of Galata Tower, uh, perhaps uh, appropriately enough surrounded by a uh, graveyard. Now, in the span of roughly three or four days from the onset of his illness, the panic induced by Haji Mustafa's symptoms, whereabouts, and contacts would attract the attention of Ottoman officials of virtually every level and description 
from the municipal authorities in Beolu, the police, the gendarme, the international delegates, the board of health, the health ministry, the naval ministry, the grand vizier, and even up to the Sultan himself. As the case began, an Austrian physician was dispatched to Haji Mustafa Effendi's home to examine him. Suspecting cholera, the alarm was raised. Copies of the examination were forwarded to the Ministry of Health. The Mutasarif of Beolu called in the police and the gendarme to place the patient under a sanitary cordon. Meanwhile, the naval ministry was instructed to place the Nimeti Huda steamer and its crew under a 10 to 12 day quarantine. There was also the need to locate and examine as many of Haji Mustafa's fellow passengers as possible. Can you imagine? Ottoman contact tracing, right? Uh, who, who would have thought? Um, with the approval of the Sultan, uh, special instructions were also sent to the Mutasarraf of Beolu and the Ministry of Police, urging them to take extreme care in the event of Haji Mustafa's death. It was recommended that his corpse be taken far outside of the city and buried in a deep grave and lined with lime and that all of his personal items should be disinfected or burned. In the midst of these frightening precautions, the Grand Vizier candidly spelled out his fear that this case might be the beginning of the next devastating epidemic in Istanbul. In this letter, he reflects back on the horrific 1865 outbreak. As he recalled, it had only taken one instance of negligence to allow an infected steamer to enter the Golden Horn at Tersane. In 1865, cholera had come to Istanbul aboard an Ottoman warship transporting a tuberculosis-stricken official. Although communication between infected ports of Egypt and Istanbul had been placed under strict quarantine measures, on its return journey, the crew had thrown two cholera victims into the sea. And unfortunately, the vessel headed straight into the Golden Horn up to the shipyard at Tersane. And that very same evening, two soldiers were admitted to the Tersane hospital. Within days, cholera had spread to the surrounding neighborhoods of Haskoy and Qasim Pasha. The outbreaks would then rage on for four months, killing as many as 1,000 per day and leaving a death toll of 30,000 by the epidemic's end. In light of the anxieties produced by this single suspected case, a scientific committee composed of members of the Board of Health and the faculty of the Imperial Medical College was assembled. But despite all of the precautions requested by the Ministry of Health, according to the Medical Commission, it was only a case of dysentery and extreme exhaustion from the three month journey to Mecca and back. However, within three days of the report, Haji Mustafa was dead and buried in accordance with the protocols laid out for a cholera death. The confusion, bureaucratic infighting, uh, international ramifications and second guessing surrounding this single suspected case of cholera give us a sense of the epidemiological anxiety that must have hung over Istanbul in these years like a kind of thick fog. Of course, Mecca was the gateway uh, uh, for, for the Ottoman Empire's experience with cholera in most years. Mecca and Hijaz had seen at least seven outbreaks of varying severity between 1831 and 1860. Then, of course, was the great outbreak in 1865, which had killed at least 15 to 30,000 pilgrims and sparked a global pandemic. Cholera broke out during every Hajj season between 1881 and 1883. And in 1883, the outbreak skipped its way to Egypt, killing approximately 50,000 there. Of course, again, estimates uh, of the 1893 death toll range from as low as 30,000 up to as high as 50,000. Thus, the anxieties and past mistakes dredged up by Haji Mustafa's 1891 case concisely illustrates a pattern that had become all too familiar to Ottoman and European physicians and officials during the period. Each time that cholera struck the Hijaz, it exponentially raised the likelihood that the disease would bloom across the width and breadth of the empire. Returning pilgrims had a way of bringing the frontier home to the imperial seat of power. Cholera annihilated the presumed difference between a modernizing, dare I say European, Istanbul, and the backward Arabian frontier. In this sense, biopolitical surveillance in Istanbul was only as effective, uh, it, only effective if it could be reproduced at the most sensitive margins of the empire in Arabia. Of course, the issue here was not just Arabia, it was points further east. Now I want to set Mecca, Istanbul, and the entirety of the Ottoman Empire against the backdrop of the ecological and demographic disasters gaining momentum in British India. 
In late Victorian Holocaust, El Nino and the Making of the Third World, Mike Davis paints an all-encompassing portrait of colonial India's ecological and demographic implosion. Davis argues that while natural factors such as El Nino patterns and the failure of the monsoon cycles might have contributed to 19th century uh, India's catastrophic mortality rates, it was the synergistic relationship between drought, famine, malaria, plague, and cholera that put this sort of uh, larger series of events in motion. And these were, of course, not natural phenomena. They were man-made crises born of colonial India's unjust agrarian, environmental, economic, and political systems. So what I've made, what I've sort of argued here in the book is that we see a kind of spillover, a kind of ecological fallout uh, that affects not only India, but the Middle East, Europe, and the entire globe. So regardless of whether one places more emphasis on human, technical, or environmental factors, colonial India's death tolls are undeniable. According to David Arnold, between 1817 and 1865, Rough estimates suggest that uh, at least 15 million Indians died from cholera alone. After 1865, more systematic if politically tainted mortality statistics began to be uh, collected. Thus from 1865 through 1947, a further 23 million deaths were recorded. Working in tandem, the vicious cycles of famine, dislocation, and cholera set in motion public health crises that would assume global proportions for the better part of the long 19th century. Though cholera had been uh, endemic in Bengal, over the course of the 19th century, it rapidly transgressed its previous endemic boundaries. And unlike the outbreaks of pre-colonial times, new patterns of British trade and military movement eventually intensified by steam and rail allowed the disease to burst beyond its previous endemic range. The steamship created entirely new circuits of transmission, allowing India's disease pool to spill over into the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf leaving the Ottoman state to defend itself and in turn the rest of Europe against uh, uh, colonialism's ecological fallout. Now, the international breaking point comes in 1865. This was the Hajj al-Akbar year uh, when the standing at Mount Arafat falls on a Friday. Uh, and of course, because such years are considered particularly auspicious, the number of pilgrims ballooned to four times more than the previous year's attendance, leading to overcrowding, food and water shortages, and the perfect environment for the spread of cholera. Although numbers vary wi widely, uh, it's thought that perhaps 30,000 of a total attendance of roughly 150,000 may have perished that year. From there, it would be spread to Egypt, Beirut, Istanbul, on to Marseille and Algiers, setting off a chain reaction that would eventually ravage Anatolia, Europe, and Russia, and smolder on almost continuously between 1865 and 1874, killing at least 200,000 people in North American and European cities alone. Now, as the global pandemic of 1865-66 unfolded, international attention was to focus squarely on the Hajj, in an age of sanitary and reform, Western Europe, of course, had already begun to take halting steps toward the environmental reorganization of its cities, water supplies, and waste disposal. These projects, although still operating without the benefit of proper germ theory, had nevertheless, nevertheless begun to push adult mortality rates downward. On the other hand, European observers saw no such progress in the Ottoman Empire, Iran, and points farther east. In 1866, the French emperor, Napoleon III, attempted to breathe new life into previous uh, uh, inconclusive international conferences on questions of quarantine and sanitation. In response to the French government's call for a conference to discuss the sanitary conditions of the East, Sultan Abdulaziz agreed, but on the condition that the conference be held in Istanbul. And thus, the 1866 Istanbul International Sanitary Conference was hosted at the famous Galatasaray Lycée. Over the course of the conference, a new era of international sanitary interventionism emerged. The delegates took a strongly contagious stance, concluding that cholera was communicable from the disease to the healthy. Moreover, they affirmed Asiatic cholera to be endemic in India and in no other country. Now, from an Ottoman perspective, these conclusions uh, of this international body were meaningful in at least two respects. First and foremost, the 1866 International Conference established an international consensus that India was the source of cholera and that it did not 
originate from within Ottoman domains. Now, this is, of course, important because of British propaganda and denialism. Now, as the Ottoman bacteriology expert Hamdi, Hamdi Ben Aziz points out in his 1893 cholera treatise, which you see on the left hand side of the screen, mobilizing international consensus around this point was a critical goal for Ottoman delegates to these international proceedings. They needed to fiercely combat uh, a sort of wave of Anglo-Indian propaganda in which uh, the phys physicians of the subcontinent uh, tended to repeatedly shift cholera's point of origin from India to the Ottoman Hijaz. Now, by 1883-84, the German bacteriologist Robert Koch, seen here in the middle of your screen, uh, his research in Egypt and India had provided definitive proof of cholera's causal agent, the comma bacillus. Koch's discovery of the role of the human intestinal tract and uh, the, the role that it played in the bacterium's life cycle and his confirmation of cholera's waterborne transmission should have brought the scientific debate surrounding cholera spread to a screeching halt. And yet, even as late as 1896, 1897, which is a famous year, of course, because of the plague outbreak in Bombay, British officials struggled to deny India's image as an exporter of cholera and other diseases and worked to obstruct the imposition of quarantine regulations internationally. They feared the interference with this pillar of the Islamic faith would spark a backlash in India and that strict quarantine measures might threaten the free flow of trade. Money really was the bottom line here. There was the secondary factor of fear of angering uh, the Muslim population of India. Now, Britain and the Anglo-Indian medical establishment essentially became deeply invested in what we would call anti-contagionist or localist theories of cholera's etiology, which blame cholera on mysterious influences in the atmosphere or so-called miasmas caused by festering human waste. Now, as Ottoman officials repeatedly complained, British intransigence in the face of unanimous international consensus was to remain a major obstacle to Ottoman sanitary security for the remainder of the century. Remember that, denialism in a pandemic, sounds familiar, right? Now, in effect, the supposedly backward Ottomans were early adopters of germ theory, following the latest breakthroughs from Koch and Pasteur, while Anglo-Indian medicine, you know, we think of the British Empire as the vanguard of so much technology and advancement, really was mired in outmoded and deeply politicized theories of cholera transmission. Again, sounds very familiar. Now, the second major result of this 1866 conference was the decision to adopt rigorous quarantine measures designed to inspect the health of all pilgrims arriving in the Hijaz. Although it would take a decade and a half for these plans to even partially materialize, the proposals laid out in 1866 eventually led to the establishment of an archipelago of quarantine stations stretching from the southern mouth of the Red Sea to the Suez Canal. This system, of course, was to be anchored by a flagship quarantine station on Cameron Island, which was positioned in the vicinity of Bab al Mandeb in order to intercept the growing influx of Indian Ocean pilgrims before they could reach Mecca's principal port of Jeddah. Although its staffing and administration were to be handled by the Ottoman state, it would also be subject to international supervision of the mixed or capitulatory Ottoman Board of Health. Now, despite the prospect of European interference, by taking primary responsibility for the sanitary policing of the Red Sea, the Ottoman state also received a degree of international legitimation for its expanding territorial claims in the Red Sea and Arabian Peninsula. Like other infrastructural projects with more overt military and strategic implications, most notably the Hijaz uh, telegraph and railway, and then uh, we could argue in uh, Iraq as well, parallel projects, the Ottoman state saw an opportunity to harness the increasing medicalization of the Hajj in order to consolidate power in one of the empire's most vulnerable semi-autonomous frontier provinces. By the early 1880s, the post-1866 policy of sending an annually appointed public health commissioner to oversee the sanitary preparedness for Hajj season was once again revived and strengthened. Likewise, plans for the long-delayed Cameron Island quarantine station began to be dusted off. So uh, there was a sort of 15-year period where you had temporary commissions, but by the time we get into the 1880s, we get a permanent sanitary presence constantly monitoring the health of the Hijaz. In late 1881, the construction of the Cameron Island quarantine station was finally underway, 
Cameron, of course, is a barren strip of sand and rocks located just off the northern Yemeni coast, some 28 kilometers north of Hudaydah and 180 nautical miles from the Straits of Bab al-Mandeb. Whatever its geographical attributes as a port uh, with relative uh, isolation, from the perspective of human comfort and environmental capacity, it's difficult to imagine many more miserable places. Um, so in the summer of 2006, I made the journey out to uh, Cameron Island, uh, and I can assure you it's not a place that you want to be stuck, uh, especially in summertime, and, and be ill. Um, so I managed to make my way around to the ruins uh, of uh, the uh, Ottoman and, and later British constructed uh, uh, sanitary buildings. Um, one of the things that you see consistently in the records uh, was complaints in the 1880s about no brick and mortar buildings. Those came after 1900. And you can see the top left, the ruins of some of those Ottoman constructed buildings. Um, but uh, at first, really all there were were what they called cow sheds uh, uh, in the British records, uh, thatched huts uh, in a Tehama style. Um, while not exactly the same thing, if you see in the middle of your screen at the bottom, this sort of thatch constructed uh, uh, resort uh, accommodation, uh, such as it was, um, this is sort of a consistent thing in all of the Ottoman and British records, the complaints about the lack of water uh, the, the sort of lack of uh, latrine facilities. This was really a rough and ready uh, sort of makeshift and a, a sort of very beginning uh, of a sort of creep towards international sanitary uh, cooperation, but a very flawed one uh, at the outset. Now, in addition to the sort of primitive conditions uh, that we saw in the 1880s, the station failed in a more fundamental respect it failed to stop cholera from reaching the Hijaz uh, initially. Although even this had a certain clarifying effect, uh, the tighter tracking of India's pilgrimage vessels made it considerably easier for Ottoman and inter international observers to identify precisely when and from where cholera was entering the Red Sea. Now, by the time we reached the early 1890s, the Hijaz and Cameron Island, of course, were ripe for change. The carnage of the early 1890s, in particular 1893, proved a tipping point both within the Ottoman Empire and internationally. In the wake of fresh outbreaks in 1890 and 1891, the 1893 Hajj Akbar season was approached with tremendous anxiety about the potential for food shortages, extreme overcrowding, and of course the increased potential for cholera outbreaks. In the month leading up to the, uh, to the Hajj, cholera had already been reported among Indians at Cameron and later among a group of Yemeni pilgrims. As Abdul Hamid Shafi, a, a physician who had witnessed the devastation firsthand, reported back to the Egyptian Board of Health, the crisis had moved so rapidly that in Mina, private residences were being converted into makeshift hospitals. However, because the proper facilities and supplies needed to treat patients were completely non-existent, these scenes quickly devolved from triage to hospice. Now, we see the images here. These appeared in the uh, French press, uh, and I apologize for their, their graphic nature, but I do think that they're important images for us to understand the way that the Hajj was being viewed at this time. Now, as uh, Abdul Hamid Shafi points out, in many neighborhoods, corpses were being buried without notifying the public health authorities. Likewise, local families had abandoned the cemeteries and were burying their dead themselves in the courtyards and gardens of their homes. As the corpses multiplied, the porters responsible for burying the dead died themselves or fled. In an attempt to clear the corpses and lift the fog of death, the Hijaz's commanding uh, officer, Diyar uh, uh, Ferik Osman Pasha, and his troops were left to bury the dead. But they themselves then, in turn, succumbed to the disease and joined the staggering death toll of some 30,000 for that Hajj season. Now, even before this 1893 outbreak, by this stage the, of the global pandemic, which had really unfurled from 1881 to 1895, regardless of the international visibility of the Hajj, it was not the only means of cholera circulation. By 1892, cholera was already raging in Yemen, Russia, Iran, Iraq, Anatolia, and of course it struck Istanbul itself. The disease had also reached France and Germany and had even spread as far as the Americas. Now, of course, 1892 also witnessed the iconic Hamburg epidemic, 
And in the literature, Hamburg has of course been long held up as the, the good epidemic, the one that made a difference and forced change finally. The Hamburg epidemic is generally thought to have produced a decisive victory for Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur's laboratory-based microbial science over the older school of miasma-based theory. Now, the more general uh, sort of uh, 19th century sanitarian obsessions with street cleaning and poor relief would no longer be adequate. Rather, in the coming years, the struggle against cholera would increasingly depend on dis disinfection technologies and safe, reliable supplies of drinking water and technical expertise, and of course, the infrastructure needed to support them. Now, a rather simplistic reading of the 1890s might attribute the reform of Ottoman quarantine and public health procedures to the withering international pressure brought on by a succession of sanitary conferences, Venice in 1892, Dresden in 1893, and especially Paris in 1894. By contrast, I'd like to make a, a, a different argument to say that the Ottoman archival record shows that the administration of public health affairs in the Hijaz and Istanbul also had their own more localized uh, antecedents, institution builders, timelines, uh, and of course, limitations. From 1895 onward, the Ottoman state would launch a new assault on cholera in the Hijaz, importing new technologies and procedures for biopolitical and environmental management, which had previously been applied in Istanbul or to foreign non-Ottoman pilgrim populations in controlled quarantine settings. Their application to Hijazi locals was perceived at this time, of course, though, as an attack on local autonomy and an illegitimate product of European extraterritorial intervention. This imagining of European manipulation of Ottoman policy was also a reflection of the widening civilizational gulf between a modernizing Istanbul and the empire's Arabian frontiers. So let us now turn our attention toward one of the principal architects of Ottoman sanitary reform, Bonkowski Pasha, Charles Bonkowski Pasha. He's a Polish refugee born in Istanbul in 1841, studied chemistry and pharmacy in Paris, and upon returning from his studies, he taught at the Maktebi Tibie. He became the first president of the Istanbul Society of Pharmacists, However, it was during Istanbul's struggle with cholera from 1892 to 1895 that Bonkowski would truly make his, his mark. He emerged as something of an equivalent to Koch and Pasteur. Perhaps to steal a, a famous line from Bruno Latour, we could say that Bonkowski was instrumental in the pasteurization, not of France, but of the Ottoman Empire. In 1893, he was made a pasha, and in 1894 was honored as the Sultan's head chemist. During this period, Bonkowski was also named as the chief, uh, chief health inspector for all of Istanbul. With cholera raging throughout the city, Bonkowski's mandate seems to have been limitless. His interventions range from issues as large as the inspection of housing, food safety, and trash removal, to questions as minute as coffee shops handling and disposal of dirty water from nargile or hookah pipes. Right? We can imagine sort of the uh, uh, epidemic potential uh, of nargile smoking. <laughs> I think COVID-19 has underscored that uh, quite well as well. Uh, I've spent the last year in Abu Dhabi and for some time, uh, you know, hookah shisha was, was forbidden, uh, but we're, we're back to that, uh, unfortunately. Um, now, uh, Bonkowski was also instrumental in the reorganization and modernization of Istanbul's sewer system and water supply, both of which were uh, made even more urgent by the coincidence of cholera and a devastating earthquake that struck Istanbul in 1894. During this period, Bonkowski Pasha would also serve as a representative to the 1893 and 1894 International Sanitary Conferences. Thus, in addition to his wide-ranging responsibilities in Istanbul, he was also one of the moving forces behind the modernization of Ottoman quarantine systems at the time. Now, Bonkowski would also become intimately familiar with the latest disinfection techniques by working alongside Dr. André Chantemesse, an assistant of Pasteur's who had been dispatched to Istanbul to assist with the 1893 cholera outbreak. Through Chantemesse, the necessary disinfection machinery and accessories were ordered from Paris, and by late 1893, Bonkowski began establishing disinfection facilities across Istanbul. Thus, contrary to previous studies, which had drawn a kind of straight line between either the 1892 Hamburg epidemic or the horrendous 1893 outbreak in Mecca, and building international pressure to produce meaningful Hodge-related reforms at the 1894 International Sanitary Conference in Paris, 
In reality, I think it would be more accurate to think of the strengthening of the Ottoman quarantine system in the Red Sea more as a byproduct of the rapid buildup of technical expertise during Istanbul's own cholera uh, outbreak from 1892 to 1895. As a result of the technical expertise that Bonkowski had built up in battling cholera in Istanbul, by the time the 1894 International Sanitary Conference met in Paris, he was armed with a list of reforms for Cameron Island. Bonkowski announced that the newly redesigned quarantine would be equipped with disinfection stoves, sterilizing machines, water filtration or condenser machines, an ice making machine, mobile receptacles for the safe removal of feces from the camp, and he also promised the construction of a new bacteriological laboratory, not perhaps a, a scaled down version of the one that you see pictured here uh, in Istanbul, uh, but nevertheless, a, a facility that would allow physicians to accurately identify cholera and constantly monitor the quality of the water supply on the quarantine island. The results of these interventions, of course, were quite remarkable. After 1895, apart from one major outbreak in uh, December 1907, when cholera victims uh, did find their way to Cameron Island, uh, individual cases no longer were metastasizing into uh, large outbreaks. After 1895, the average mortality among pilgrims on Cameron Island plummeted from 3.37 per 1,000 to less than one. For years, Cameron, and of course the Hijaz's wells and water tanks had been veritable uh, cholera incubators. However, after the installation of the island's water condenser system, cholera could finally be contained and isolated. Here you see a picture. This is not taken from Cameron, but this was a unit that was installed in Jeddah uh, just before World War I, and which is the subject of the fourth chapter of my book, and actually has sort of sparked my interest in desalination technology as a sort of lens to view the modern Arabian Peninsula. So perhaps in the questions, we can take that up as well. Um, now, these uh, quite remarkable results on Cameron, um, the same really couldn't be said for the Hijaz itself. It was a, a tougher uh, uh, puzzle, if you will. Unlike the controlled environment of the quarantine island, the Hijaz was a much larger and more complicated puzzle of overlapping social, religious, technical, environmental, and biological challenges. Ottoman attempts to address these problems would require the kind of invasive centralizing forms of sanitation and surveillance being applied in Istanbul and in other parts of the empire. But the Hijaz was theoretically an autonomous province exempt from Tanzimat style European uh, 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 innovations, and of course, a much, much more religiously conservative environment. Now, in 1894, the installation of disinfection machines at Jeddah and Mecca provided powerful new symbols for local resistance. What was different about these new measures was that unlike the remote quarantines enforced in the Red Sea, Ottoman disinfection procedures within the Hijaz did not distinguish between foreign pilgrims and locals or even make exceptions for women. Foreign pilgrims had been subjected to the inconveniences and indignities of the state's medical examinations for years. However, this level of medical discipline had never been attempted on Hijazi locals themselves. While the object of the disinfection process was to sterilize clothing items, the mysterious nature of the machinery and the culturally unthinkable notion of officials requiring men and women to undress stoked the imagination. As Dr. Proust, the French delegate to the Board of Health explained, in short order, the exotic procedure gave rise to wild rumors that the victims of this process, rather than just their clothes, would be stripped naked and placed inside the dis disinfection machines. Even though two female attendants had been secured to oversee the process, Upon hearing these frightening rumors, many female pilgrims reported, reportedly refused to travel farther than Jeddah during the 1894 Hajj season. Now, in 1895, local anger over disinfection procedures reached a boiling point. As Jules Gervais Cortelemont narrates the events, a number of influential sheikhs went before the Sharif of Mecca, on Rafiq, to address the public outrage surrounding the disinfection machines. Aside from insulting the honor of Hijazi women, among both the Bedouin and urban populations of the Hijaz, the disinfection machines and newly organized uh, quarantine hospitals had given credence to popular conspiracy theories surrounding cholera. As the British consul warned, the disinfection machines played into a deep rooted local conviction among the cholera, uh, among uh, uh, locals that cholera was being introduced into the country by quarantine doctors via the disinfection machines themselves. Again, the conspiracy theories sort of uh, confusing cause and cure. 
uh, here. Likewise, all who entered the Hijaz's field hospitals were likely to die, not because of the disinfection machines, but because of the poor understanding uh, of uh, any possible treatment, leading to the belief that they were being purposefully killed by Europeanized Ottoman doctors charged with their care. Now this reaches a, a final a rupture point on the 30th of May, 1895. A mob of Wateba tribesmen and local Meccans attacked the disinfection, di disinfection equipment and completely destroyed the offices housing it. That same evening, a group of foreign consular officials had gone for a walk roughly a half mile beyond Jidda's city walls. The group was attacked and shot by a Bedouin party who quickly fled by camel. The acting Russian consul was seriously wounded, but the British consul and the chancellor of the French consulate were both lightly wounded. However, the long-serving British Indian Muslim consul, uh, vice consul, Dr. Abdul Razak was killed. Later, Jidda's disinfection facilities were ransacked by a party of Bukharan pilgrims, forcing sanitary officials to seek san uh, a sanctuary in boats anchored offshore. And two days later, Mecca's hospital was also looted. So we have a province-wide rebellion against sanitary procedures. The situation became so sensitive that the Sultan's war cabinet had to be convened to discuss the possibility of a European military intervention in the Hijaz. In the meantime, sanitary operations within the Hijaz ground to a complete halt. Construction on new hospitals in Jeddah and Mecca was suspended. Indeed, it was even suggested that the still unfinished buildings be demolished to appease the mob. European consuls and foreign subjects were taken on board a British cruiser to ensure their uh, security. Jeddah's harbor was rapidly populated by British, Dutch, French, and Russian warships. Now, despite the popular imaginings of Hijazi locals, the implementation of disinfection procedures, of course, could not be attributed solely to European powers or the mixed Board of Health. If anything, it would be more accurate to argue that the reforming energies of Ottoman technocrats like Bankowski Pasha had pushed the Board of Health toward more aggressive measures rather than vice versa. The overhaul of the Hijaz sanitary administration in these years, 1894-1895, should not be read exclusively as a product of international pressure from Europe. Instead, it would be more useful to think of disinfection machines, quarantine hospitals, and the increasing visibility of public health officials in the Hijaz and the Red Sea as a natural manifestation of Istanbul's technopolitical modernization, reaching out from Istanbul into the empire's Arabian frontier and reproducing itself. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lowe. Um, <clears throat> every, uh, we will now be moving uh, to the public question and A period. Um, if we'd like to take one or two minutes uh, for a brief uh, break or to prepare some questions, I would welcome that. Um, uh, if so, uh, please feel free, uh, we, will, we will reconvene. Um, I have 2.45 p.m. in my clock, so we'll, we will reconvene at 2.47. <clears throat> uh, for the members of the public who would like to submit uh, questions uh, for discussion, please make use of the menu bar item uh, typically located on the bottom uh, uh, portion of your Zoom screen. Uh, it says Q and A uh, with the chat, two chat bubbles. And I will, um, I will identify uh, submissions as they come in. All right, thank you. It is uh, 2.47. So Michael, uh, I'd like to get us started on a little bit of discussion about the work that you have uh, done. Uh, you mentioned in your talk that uh, uh, the uh, inception of uh, the topic uh, 
uh, you encountered, was it I think 15 years ago, if I heard correctly. Um, in, as a historian, I am not a historian, but uh, I, I find, and, and therefore I find the temporal robustness of a historical approach quite uh, the most uh, captivating thing to begin with. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, not just you know uh, the timeline of the work itself, but where are you currently? Where is the work at the current stage? What are the next set of research questions or puzzles uh, that your work uh, continues to um, focus on? Or have you identified new questions and puzzles from the work that you've done in this area? Sure. Um, you know, I mentioned the 15 years. I mean, I think uh, especially for students, PhD students, master's students, uh, undergraduate students who are thinking about doing this kind of work, that can be a kind of daunting uh, proposition, right? Um, so I first uh, began thinking about Hajj uh, around 2005, 2006, uh, while I was a master's student at Georgia State University. Um, I'd started uh, with the encouragement of Don Reed, who's an Egypt specialist. Uh, he had convinced me, uh, I'd said I wanted to do something with British India. And he said, look, study Persian, see, see how that goes. And maybe it's a stepping stone to, to do Urdu. Um, so I started with Persian. Um, and then uh, once I had sort of gotten an appetite for Arabic scripts, started with Arabic the, the following year. And that was about the same time that I stumbled uh, onto the topic uh, using uh, British archival materials. And really this sort of my approach to Hajj became a sort of trans-regional approach that was partly, I think, a, in intellectual step with the times, right? Uh, trying to do more global trans-regional sort of area studies busting uh, kinds of topics. But um, it was also a consequence of sort of the, the the steps of growing my language skills, right? So moving from doing um, uh, uh, British records with, with English to doing Arabic materials uh, and uh, in my time in Yemen, and then in my PhD program, working with uh, Turkish and Ottoman Turkish materials uh, in Istanbul. And so that kind of allowed me to grow with the project a bit from British Imperial to sort of a more Arabian Peninsula centric version to then a sort of more total version that encompassed all three of those areas. Um, and that's really been a hallmark of, I think my intellectual curiosity is a way of, instead of doing a kind of, uh, what I think of as a kind of hollow global history that is colonial archives looking out from Europe is to really do a sort of more area studies informed thick transregionalism that has the kind of uh, area studies, ethnographic on the ground experience, right? Um, and a thickness of, uh, of the archival materials from the region in addition to those colonial materials and actually trying to make them uh, sort of speak back to one another mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and talk back. So I, you know, from, from starting with those sort of Indian Ocean histories that seem to be, you know, uh, colonial archive only, I wanted to sort of speak back in Turkish and Arabic. Um, and so that's, that's been a sort of preoccupation throughout my career. Um, my new work is really spinning out of this. I mean, the Hajj book was, as you mentioned in our, our chat before the recording started, uh, certainly an STS informed uh, endeavor uh, with chapters on international law, quarantine, uh, uh, water infrastructure, transportation, passports, uh, railways, telegraphs, that kind of thing. Um, and sort of spinning out of that, uh, I wrote a, an article back in uh, 2015, which I have to give credit to, to Michigan, uh, the famous uh, Comparative Studies in Society and History uh, uh, gave me that opportunity. But it was a way for me to think a little bit beyond the first book project and connect it with a new topic, and that was desalination technology. So I showed the uh, image of the condenser unit that I kind of stumbled upon in my research in Istanbul, and it really got me thinking, this is sort of what the Arabian Peninsula, you know, present day or post-1970 Saudi Arabia or the UAE or Kuwait looks like with uh, extensive desalination facilities. But what's the longer history of man-made water in the peninsula? And so that really is the, the new project is to try and trace a history of how uh, 
uh, coal-fired desalination technology came as early as the middle, middle of the 19th century with the British Empire, um, and then sort of transformed uh, once we get to the uh, discovery of oil in the peninsula into, uh, I think, the most fundamental material fact of everyday life in the peninsula. And so again, trying to approach uh, Arabia, not from an oil first perspective, uh, but from a water first perspective and, and really sort of turn that paradigm on its head a bit. Fascinating. Um, there, there's just, that's just such a rich uh, set of reflections. Um, you know, I, I as a uh, communication and media studies person, you know, I want to have a little meta moment here. I think the fact that we're conducting this over Zoom, uh, the medium has kind of flatten the presence of the audience. Uh, we may get questions come through the chat bar, but um, in lieu of the lack of being able to see each other in a more um, face-to-face -face setting, uh, I wonder if we could uh, uh, approach this as a panel discussion as well. Uh, I will uh, try my best to think of, I think, angles and perspectives that might be interesting from a very general uh, uh, broad uh, public perspective, and I have two or three uh, uh, approaches that uh, that I wanted to ask about. Um, uh, and actually, maybe we can get to that approach after we cover our first uh, question uh, that's been submitted on the bar. So let's uh, let me turn to that first. This question comes from Salma Hamami, a University of Michigan undergraduate student. Uh, uh, she asks. Um, Hello, what treatments were available during the late 1800s to help those infected with cholera? Can you go into more detail about the health disparities faced among minorities at that time when being treated for cholera? You mentioned the notion about the Hajj pilgrimage from non-Muslims was one that was quite negative, especially due to the outbreak. How did this notion impact pilgrimers' journey to Hajj and did it pose any extra challenges? So uh, there are three questions here. Um, and I believe uh, I read it as having two parts. Number one, uh, a, a more general question about what were the treatments available during the late 1800s to help those infected with cholera? And the second two questions, I believe they cluster together a bit. Can you go over some more detail about health disparities faced by minorities at that time when treated by cholera? And relatedly, were there differential experiences uh, with regard to Hajj pilgrimage for non-Muslims uh, during the outbreak? And did they face extra challenges? So let, let, me, let me address the, the first question. Um, so in the late 19th century, um, treatment or let's say management of cholera symptoms uh, was virtually non-existent. And the reason that I say that is even up through the 1890s, uh, we don't discover the mechanisms, right, of the, the actual uh, cholera bacillus uh, until the 1880s, right? So there, uh, up until the 1880s, the actual germ theory behind uh, what was making people sick uh, was unknown. And it takes, let's say at least another decade uh, perhaps more for that to be sort of diffused and become more generalized uh, knowledge. So in fact, most of uh, what could be done was essentially uh, quarantine and kind of palliative management, um, treating symptoms uh, in terms of making people comfortable. There was very little that could be done. It wasn't until the 20th century that it was discovered that actually sugar water uh, is a way to rehydrate uh, rapidly enough um, but that really wasn't understood at the time, right? So kind of a, a different era of medicine. Um, the second set of questions I think is the more interesting one, um, at least for this period, um, in, in terms of thinking about health disparities. Um, here, I don't wanna sort of uh, think of this as, as minorities per se, right? Because uh, in this situation, uh, everyone going on hash uh, you know, is, is Muslim. So you're, we don't have a very differentiated uh, subset other than by nationality. Uh, but uh, what I will say is that um, in the book, one of the things that I try to think about, and I sort of steal a page from uh, the great UNC scholar, Jamil Aydin, who writes about the ways in which 19th century Orientalist thinking minoritized Muslims. 
turned Muslims into a kind of undifferentiated racial minority. And it ascribes certain qualities to them. Um, and in the case of Hajj, uh, uncleanliness was one of those generalized ideas uh, as a sort of sanitary danger. But this also merged in European minds with security danger, anti-colonialism, Wahhabism, pan-Islam, uh, sort of radicalism, uh, and a, a, a sort of tendency towards violence, um, which were all, you know, obviously Orientalist misconceptions. But what it did was it made the Hajj uh, turn into something that was seen as a security risk, both from a sanitary and a sort of uh, intellectual perspective. And so travel arrangements in the 19th century, if we think about passports and uh, regulation of steamship travel, I would say 19th century colonial thought uh, uh, sort of uh, called out two groups in particular, Asian labor migration and Muslim travelers going on Hajj. And I think that this approximates some of the sort of uh, intellectual problems that we might think of as being quite contemporary, right? Post 9-11 uh, issues, uh, airports, uh, security concerns over terrorism, uh, unfairly sort of uh, tarnishing uh, Muslim refugees as potential terrorists. This is a very long intellectual legacy of thinking about people who really are in some sort of uh, uh, need in this case uh, as potential dangers. And it's sort of inscribed into our travel and border systems. Um, and so I try to highlight that issue as a very long standing one um, that is, is quite problematic for us. Um, another issue that I would say in terms of health disparity is many Muslims complained about their experiences uh, dealing with uh, physicians and officials while on Hajj. One complaint was Christian doctors being uh, placed in quarantine facilities in Cameron and in, in Jeddah. Um, part of this was a practical matter of uh, more Ottoman Christian physicians being trained, um, but it also created certain uh, cross-cultural misunderstandings, uh, uh, certainly worries about uh, uh, gender issues. Um, there were also more practical matters, uh, announcements not being posted in proper languages, right? So you might have a poster that read in uh, Ottoman, Arabic, and Hindustani. Um, but of course, not all pilgrims coming from the four corners of the globe uh, could read one of those three languages. Uh, oftentimes, guards uh, or people who were in charge of food and water they spoke none of the languages that pilgrims uh, could speak. And so those created sort of frustration points for, for pilgrims uh, as they traveled. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another submission from a student. Rachel Goldenberg, um, an undergraduate student asks, you mentioned how the disinfectant machines and sanitation practices led to some conspiracy theories surrounding cholera spread. Was there a big political divide between those who believed these, th these theories versus those who trusted the science, like we've seen uh, with COVID in the United States today? So, you know, I'm constantly struck. Uh, it, it's, it's been interesting to watch uh, the sort of conspiracy theories here in the United States unfold in light of, uh, you know, having written this book. Now, obviously, this is a different situation in that um, those who were believing these conspiracy theories um, were, in essence, this wasn't a political issue. It wasn't about uh, party identification or anything like that. It's more of a sense of the foreignness uh, of the medical practices, the newness of thinking in terms of germ theory, um, the, the newness of these technologies and associating them, even though they were being uh, imported by Ottoman Muslim officials, they were associated with Europe. Um, and it was very difficult for the Ottomans to sort of uh, convince the local Arab and pilgrim populations uh, that this was in fact helping their cause uh, and, and preventing uh, illness. Um, and in part, I, look, the pilgrims certainly had a, a point to be made. They suffered a great deal of indignities, um, uh, very horrible conditions on board steamships often, uh, delays to their Hajj journey in very uncomfortable uh, conditions. And they oftentimes met those uh, hardships with equanimity and patience. Um, and they were treated poorly by these officials. So they weren't necessarily predisposed to trust them. 
The other thing is because of the lack of uh, clear scientific knowledge about how to treat cholera, people were dying anyway. So it was easy to believe that interaction with these doctors would lead to bad outcomes, right? Um, no one wants to go to a hospital where no one's coming out the other side of the, the door, so to speak. And so we have to have some, I think some real sympathy um, for the lack of awareness um, about uh, germ theory and modern medicine that was in its very, very infancy. We're not talking about a matter of, uh, you know, decades, we're, we're talking about single years in some instances. So I think we have to have some, uh, uh, some patience and sympathy for our, uh, our 19th and early 20th century subjects that perhaps we shouldn't have for our contemporaries today. <laughs> Got it. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, lines up with Rachel, uh, the, perhaps the intent of Rachel's question, given that in the current pandemic, there are new uh, medical technologies being tested. There is uh, a lack of understanding, a great deal of anxiety uh, in navigating that. And all of us are watching the various ways in which different states around the world are seeing varying levels of trust uh, in institutions, in expertise, in expert-produced knowledge. Um, if I may, I'd like to ask a quick follow-up just for a short reflection. Uh, from your work in, uh, in the historical period, uh, in Ottoman history, in, uh, in the Hejaz, um, would you characterize the public's reaction more as leaning towards uh, discomfort, anxiety, and uh, re reaction or resistance? Or uh, was the public's relationship with state apparatuses, state, let's say, state mandated institutional efforts, uh, were, was public behavior more compliant uh, or more resigned or more authentically trustful? Mm -hmm. What were the relationship dynamics like uh, at the time you studied uh, uh, this type of issue? Yeah, I think this is a really difficult question to get at in some respects, because is the resistance uh, to these interventions, is it about cholera? Um, and I think one of the things that my book shows is that uh, there is a great deal of resistance to any attempts to do away with local autonomy, the sort of traditional constitutional arrangement between the Ottoman state and the Hijaz. And the 19th century is sort of a period where the Ottomans everywhere are trying to homogenize the state, centralize the state, in part because they're trying to protect themselves from, you know, colonial interventions, right? But for local peoples, this often means that their traditional privileges and autonomy from state interference, whether it be taxation or, you know, medical surveillance, any of these kinds of things, they had no interest in sort of allowing the state into their lives in that way. So uh, oftentimes uh, it's, a, it's a tricky question. Are we seeing resistance to mm -hmm. the particular intervention or a more generalized uh, lack of acceptance to this uh, more intrusive uh, governmentality that's being projected from Istanbul, right? So that's kind of one of the, I guess, points of tension, uh, certainly in my book. I mean, you know, this, this question about resistance uh, is an interesting one, uh, resistance to science. Um, and I, I wanted to be very careful to say that uh, the pilgrims at the time uh, oftentimes were quite pliant uh, and respectful of uh, these regulations. I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind here is that the talk that I gave in this pandemic that I'm looking at really stretches from the 1830s well into the 20th century. So we're not talking about a one or two year, mm -hmm. uh, you know, flu or coronavirus event, or even if it was a five year event, this is a multi-decade event. So there's certainly a, a sense of resignation. And I, I can now imagine, you know, how would you be um, too anxious 30 or 40 or 50 years into a pandemic? At a certain point, I think pilgrims had the sense I have to, you know, live out my religious obligations. I need to go to Hajj because this is something that's personally important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're confronted with a state who's putting up, you know, barriers in your way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to think of the terms of, of what makes the resistance. The last point that I would make here is to make a comparison, right? Um, so much of the literature on this topic has talked about the resistance 
the irrationality, the fanaticism uh, of Muslims and resistance to colonial or state interventions uh, or science. Um, and I would just sort of make a point that in both this instance, cholera and COVID-19, uh, Europe and the United States have shown themselves to be more apt to engage in outright programs of denial, uh, uh, propaganda that sort of twists uh, the, the terms of science, um, and a, a penchant for flouting travel restrictions or public health controls, right? So um, if we look at the responses from the Middle East, from the Arabian Peninsula, they've been very careful, kept case numbers very low. Um, Saudi Arabia's handling of Hajj has been extremely careful. Um, and I think part of that is the sort of historical legacy at the 19th century, um, because Good stewardship over the Hajj means good stewardship of public health. And in fact, Hajj uh, public health controls are not a Muslim only issue, they're a global issue. And so I think that they were very concerned that this was going to sort of tarnish uh, their reputation as uh, servitors of the two holy places, Khadim al Haramain and Sharafain, and mm -hmm. acted you know, with that level of extreme caution. So I guess. Um, I want to put the shoe on the other foot, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's the West that has been quite irresponsible at times. And the Muslim world has behaved pretty well uh, mm -hmm. in this instance. Uh, thank you for such a, a thorough and thoughtful reflection. Um, you know, in, 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 my, in, in watching you present um, earlier, I was leaning towards looking for equivalencies and commonalities. But uh, with respect to you as a historian, I, I was reminded myself that uh, it, it might be more important to deeply reflect on the qualitative differences. I mean, a lot has changed uh, in any five year, 10 year period, but here we're talking about 100, 150 year spread. And uh, with regard to qualitative differences in global connectivity, um, movement of bodies and logistics and, and goods, uh, we are quite in a different place today. And, the question in my neck of the academic woods these days is always, are our institutions and our institutional arrangements up for the task for the situation as it is today, although they are built on historical context? And, 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 and your, your reflection on how uh, GCC countries may have handled COVID nowadays, uh, you know, it kind of provides a counter perspective, again, that, well, you can't separate history in understanding uh, how institutions and uh, legacies of mentalities are also shaped on uh, lineages of experiences. Um, well, um, uh, I have another question here from Andrew Williams. Uh, the question states, with the denial of cholera by other parties, how did you go about finding an accurate number of cholera cases? What would you say was the biggest challenge when doing this? Uh, thank you, Andrew, for asking this question. It's a methods-oriented question. Yeah. So if you could take this as an opportunity to reflect on you know, what, what efforts you've had to put, what challenges uh, a historian faces when doing the type of work you do, uh, I think Andrew's question would be very interesting. So I, I just wanna say, this is a great question. Uh, and uh, I think part of my the big thing that uh, shapes my methodology is I use uh, four, four languages essentially in, in this book. So Ottoman Turkish, modern Turkish, which give or take are you know, more or less the, the same thing, just in Arabic script, uh, Arabic, and then uh, British colonial sources and, uh, and English secondary literature. Um, when approaching colonial sources, right, we, we know that they're infamously uh, biased and, and have certain uh, issues that we have to, we have to uh, handle them with, with great care. Um, so my attitude always has been to say, take an issue and make sure that you have material on both sides of this imperial divide, if possible, and see where you can make them meet and usually where you find disagreements, that tension is where the issue lies, right? Um, so statistics, um, one uh, happy thing uh, is that the numbers uh, in terms of cholera cases coming via steamship, which is really the, the bulk of uh, the Indian transport, South Asian and Indian Ocean transport, uh, 
lines up pretty nicely because there's a choke point, right? You have to board a steamship. Let's say there are a dozen steamships sailing from Bombay uh, and there's 900 people, 500 people, 300 people on a given ship. Um, it's very easy to count the people and the numbers of cases that are produced when they land in Aden or Cameron or Jeddah, right? So that creates uh, some statistical ease uh, there. And I, I noticed this pretty early on that when I was able to get my hands on good Ottoman statistics, that they came very close to the British ones. So that gave me some relative comfort that these empires who disagreed on many, many things uh, from a statistical standpoint actually could overlap. Now, you have a harder question in terms of when we get away from port cities. So let me answer this in, in two ways. One is the Indian data. Um, I actually scratched out a line or two in the talk just for uh, uh, the sake of time, but one of the problems in the 19th century was classifications of um, uh, cholera as so-called famine diarrhea. Um, and so the British were, they liked to downplay the, the number of cholera cases because it, it brought so much negative attention to India from the international community. And there was so much fear of what that could mean in terms of its economic position, right? So there was a lot of not only denial about the causes, etiology, spread, but also the raw numbers themselves were quite politicized. Um, so I, I mentioned that, you know, David Arnold says from, you know, 1865 to 1947, you had maybe over 20 million uh, cholera deaths. Um, that number actually could be larger, um, but the statistics are a bit gerrymandered. Um, the other uh, methodological question that I'm uh, toying with right now has to do with overland uh, transmission. So we have some pretty good uh, literature on how cholera moves, say, from Bombay uh, to Yemen, to Mecca, to uh, Suez Canal, to Istanbul, uh, over maritime steamship routes. Um, but it's much more difficult for us from an archival perspective to say, how does cholera move from Basra, Basra to Najaf, to Karbala, to Mosul, to Diyarbakir, to Raqqa, to Adana, you know, that overland route uh, from Iraq to Eastern Anatolia. Uh, we know from the Ottoman archive that there are plenty of cases of cholera in those regions, but no one's written about that etiology. So I'm working with a colleague. Uh, we're part of a, a, a major uh, partnership grant with McGill University called Appraising Risk. And my colleague at the University of Minnesota, uh, a, a uh, Kurdish uh, Ottoman historian, Zozan Pahlevan, uh, we are trying to sort of pool our environmental history resources. And we've basically taken 22,000 entries, summaries from the Ottoman archive and put them into a database uh, with the help of uh, some of my PhD students and are starting to try and map what the spread of cholera looks like across Indian Ocean adjacent regions. Um, and so we're sort of employing a more big data sort of uh, digital humanities approach to deal with the problem of, you know, not being able to, no one has time to read 22,000 Ottoman documents. You know, that's a lifetime of work, um, but trying to sort of suss through um, what that spread actually looks like. So the methods question statistically uh, depends on where you are, right? We have really good Anglophone statistics, do we believe them? Mm -hmm. In the Ottoman case, there's statistical data, but how can we access them, right? How can one person or a small team of people uh, get through the labor of reading that many Ottoman documents? Um, so those are some of the issues that we're grappling with. Wonderful, thank you. Um, you know, uh, just as a general note for everyone attending, uh, we have about five and a half minutes left. Uh, for our public Q&A uh, portion. If you have other questions, uh, these questions have been fantastic. Please continue to submit them in the Q&A um, tool of Zoom, and I will bring them into discussion. Um, otherwise, uh, Michael, I thought it'd be very interesting, uh, at least in, in my mind, uh, to elucidate a little bit uh, or uh, reflect a little bit on uh, for, for with the public's uh, or my my assumption about the, uh, from a public's perspective, uh, you know, not just uh, what you study, uh, the time and period and the case that you study, uh, but your current uh, thoughts and reflections on uh, 
uh, where your field is. For example, our topic uh, uh, for this uh, semester uh, is quite literally a multidisciplinary exhibition on the issue of public health and pandemics uh, with a focus in Middle East, North Africa. Um, so uh, rather than asking such a broad question, I have maybe a, a bit more of a narrow one. Um, and this is coming more from left field, I, I think, um, as a way to uh, pull out what the disciplinary value and capabilities of a historical approach are, the question would be, um, what are some of the risks with thinking uh, only historically in trying to understand uh, the, the current issue of public health and pandemics? Typically, this question is asked from the perspective of what can we learn about the pandemic we're living through today by being historically informed? I'd like to instead ask the antonym of the question, um, what might we become uh, at risk of ignoring or what, what are the disciplinary determinisms involved in thinking historically in trying to assess uh, complex current issues? You may have, you know, I'm sure interesting thoughts, but uh, I don't know if that's a question you've been asked before. No, I, I've, I've never had that, that exact question put to me. It sort of, uh, you know, again, puts the, the shoe on the other foot. I mean, I think one of the worries uh, that, that I would say is that if you ask this question in 1980 or 1990, I think that our institutions might have had more in common, right? We, we could draw a line from international sanitary conferences to League of Nations to World Health Organization. But the environment that we're in in a post-internet world um, is quite different, right? So uh, uh, I mentioned the example of disinformation uh, being uh, posited by the British, uh, but the speed of transport of that misinformation uh, was the speed of uh, newspapers and telegraphs, yes. not the speed of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I do think that there is something uh, that can be problematic about comparisons across vast amounts of time and space, right? I've seen people want to draw uh, sort of connections with the 1918, 1919 flu pandemic. And, uh, you know, maybe it's my own sort of uh, gravitation towards plague and cholera, but there are times when I think maybe that's not the, the right example mm -hmm. uh, for us to be sort of uh, putting forward. I mean, uh, I think in terms of uh, thinking about the pandemic as a kind of marathon, messaging has been really poor um, mm -hmm. because I think a public can say, well, 1918, 19, 19 flu pandemic, you know, in two years, it'll go away. Well, the counter examples would be decades. I mean, plague and cholera are decade and century long events that are recurring and they mm -hmm. come back over and over and over again. And I don't think that we've prepared the public very well with some of the historical examples that we've chosen mm -hmm. um, in part because so much has changed about our level of connectivity. Um, I, I guess another example, if we wanted to sort of uh, make this a, a Middle East centric example, uh, I had a colleague of mine uh, kind of say, you know, people thought that uh, Muslim populations were gonna get very upset with the cancellation of the Hajj and, you know, look how little uh, complaint there, there was uh, maybe this tells us something about the 19th century that all the claims uh, about that period were false. I think the environments are so different politically and so different in terms of uh, the, the states, the nature of the states that mm -hmm. we're encountering, that making those comparisons, it, it loses as much as it captures, right? So yes. I, I, I do think your reticence uh, in terms of thinking historically, I think there's a place for it, but I think that there are certainly limitations, right? Um, you know, as a, a sort of a part-time, I guess, uh, environmental historian, this is definitely a danger, right? Because mm -hmm. we're sort of often asked to weigh in on things that are present and reaching into the future yes. with sort of past modeling. And we're usually pretty bad at that. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll, I'll leave that there. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, I, should, uh, I should chime in just for a little bit to say I, I asked the question with the intent of great enthusiasm and appreciation for uh, a historian's ethos and effort. Um, and I thought it would just elicit an interesting response, which, which it certainly did. Uh, I, I personally uh, share, I think, a bit of your sentiment that um, 
when all of this started, there was great trepidation about the unknown, yet at the same time, on the other hand, there was an expectation, I think, shared widely um, that uh, this could be managed, it ought to be managed, and uh, what a great failing if it were to drag on. Uh, yet, a historical approach, I think, shines light on the fact that it's more often for these things to drag on rather than complex bureaucracies to administer efficient solutions uh, deftly and correctly at the first attempt. Uh, and in that void is where I think, you know, my own comparative international observations and reflections tend to go. Um, so, so, so your presentation has been personally to me quite fascinating and illuminating. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, well, everyone, uh, we are now uh, post the uh, allotted time for the public Q&A section. I want to thank everyone who provided such interesting prompts uh, for our guest expert to think to and respond to today. Uh, I want to thank Michael, uh, Professor Lowe, for uh, uh, being with us today. Um, with that, I uh, would like to uh, welcome you all back next Wednesday for the continuation of this series.